Welcome to Pete's Property Podcast, brought to you by Buyers Buyers and hosted by Pete Wargent, buyers agent, finance and real estate expert, and all-round property guru, plus published author. Join Pete for 30 minutes as he chats all things property with a new guest each week. Learn practical tips from the movers and shakers in the property industry and well-known personalities sharing their property journeys. Just letting all my podcasters know that I have a webinar next Thursday at 7pm Australia Eastern Standard Time. I'll be discussing my investment tips and investment hotspots and I'll be joined by fellow property expert Alistair Lias. So to secure your spot, register at buyersbuyers.com.au or you can click on the registration link in this episode's show notes. G'day, welcome to this week's episode of the Pete Wargent Property Pod. I'm delighted to have a regular guest back on the show, Michael Yardney. Uh, Michael, welcome. It's always great to get your insights. Thanks, Pete. I always have fun when we have these chats. I'm hoping you can uh, speak a lot this week because, as you can hear, I've, uh, like almost everybody else at the moment, got a bit of a sore throat. So, uh, yeah. You've you... been yelling at the cricket too much, though, haven't you? <laughs> yeah. Don't let everybody know what uh, the cause was. But, uh, you know, so I've actually been under the weather for a day or two. So, um, but I'm sure we can hold up for half an hour. So, I thought, Michael, it would be great to get you back on because there's been lots of chat in the media about the property downturn. People asking me all the time, you know, when's this going to finish? How bad's it going to be? Should I buy now? Should I buy later? Um, so I thought a really good subject for today would just be to run through the most pressing property questions um, that you're being asked at the moment. Now, I know you've had uh, similar questions from your subscribers and your database and your clients, and um, mm. it sounds like a few questions are popping up. Um, over and over again. In particular, there were four that we sort of identified. So I think um, easy discussion. Let's just run through what people are asking and sure. um, be great to get your view. Happy to do that, Pete. Okay. Well, um, yes, as we mentioned, a lot of the media at the moment is talking about the potential quantum of the property market downturn. And as we know, property markets always cycle and they always will. And I guess you've been around for so many cycles now over the past mm. four or five decades that um, you would have seen many of these questions multiple times. So I guess the uh, the first uh, common question or theme that seems to be coming up at the moment is how important is actually timing the property market? If you're going to be a portfolio investor looking to build wealth for the long term or even intergenerational wealth, how important is it to actually get the timing right and how important is it simply to be in the market for a long time? That question comes up all the time. So to put some context to this, as you said a moment ago, the property markets are just doing what they always do. They're cycling, aren't they, Pete? And as you said, I've invested through now almost five decades of cycles. I didn't understand this. I didn't know this when I first started. There weren't the podcast, the, the YouTube videos. There wasn't the internet. And the data was very lagging when I first started investing in the, the 70s. And by the time you knew a cycle had moved on, it was too late. But now everyone's trying to get ahead of it. So maybe we should just look at what's currently happening. And is the market Market cycling, and we are in an adjustment phase of the property market. And there are multiple markets in Australia. So all the commentary talks about the property market. But we know that Sydney and Melbourne, and in particular the more affluent suburbs and that, are moving backwards. They're, they're dropping a little bit in value. And Brisbane, Perth, and Adelaide are, are doing okay. So I can see a multi speed market moving forward. So one thing that cycling is the market, but the other is emotions. Pete, we're back to that FOMO gone now, and it's phobia or fear of buying early, fear of making a decision. So us as consumers are also doing what we always do. We've moved to the next stage of our sentiment cycle, Pete. Just casting my mind back um, to some of the seminars that you used to do, I'm thinking way back at City Tats and those kind of venues, maybe uh, what's well, the best part of 20 years ago. And yet there would always be some people who turned up to those seminars, 
every you know every year they'd be there taking notes making all kinds of detailed transcriptions and everything about what you were saying but then they're always just waiting for the perfect opportunity or the perfect time right and then but they'd be back the next year and the next year and they never actually did anything you know and uh, i guess that is one potential trap is that of course you don't want to make a rush decision but i think you can swing too far in the other direction and just get this sort of analysis paralysis and never actually taking any action at all that makes sense so we are human and of course our decisions are driven by emotion and it is fear and greed that's driving the markets and currently it's actually fear confusion lack of consumer sentiment so while overall the fundamentals of our economy and our property markets are still pretty good pete what's really missing at the moment is consumer sentiment and in due course Greed will overtake fear, but at the moment, fear is overtaking greed. And life will get on again. People still are going to want to make their lifestyle decisions and move forward. But if we actually have a look at the influences on the market at the moment, before my long-winded answer to your question, should you time the market, maybe we should see what's influencing the market to help make that decision. And there are other negative influences. There's the fear of rising inflation, the cost of living pressures, the continual discussion about rising interest rates eating into your budgets and reducing borrowing capacity. Clearly, in some states, affordability concerns are now affecting the market. You know, properties have gone up 20 30% in Sydney, Melbourne, well, most states, uh, but, but wages haven't gone up. And I think it's really also the big uncertainty about the economic future, Pete. You can't get away from talks of recessions overseas, ongoing geopolitical problems, COVID. So there's no doubt that that's giving a negative influence on, the, on our sentiment, isn't it? Yeah, I think it. When you look at the uh, the fundamentals of the market, um, I mean, they're certainly a lot better than they were. Um, if you think back to oh, the yeah. early days of the pandemic, and we had no immigration, there was um, well, there was a period there where we had forecasts for ten percent unemployment, huge amount of uncertainty pre vaccine, and when all the lockdowns were happening. And if anything, we seem to have um, well, I guess partly because of the huge stimulus that was put in place both monetary and fiscal we've now gone to the other end of the spectrum where the unemployment rate might fall this week to what 3.7 or 3.8 percent we've got record employment well there's a job for everybody who wants one there's nearly half a million job vacancies and incomes are finally actually growing so all of those factors as immigration comes back are very strong in terms of housing market demand and fundamentals but as you mentioned, I think the one thing that's missing is uh, sentiment, and it's all driven by, I suppose, fear of rising interest rates because a lot the of media, the well, media is driving it. <laughs> Yeah, so you're of, right. So um, there's really strong fundamentals, Pete. There's lots more than that. Our economy is strong, as you said. Household balance sheets are strong. We've got that natural buffer of 250 billion, 260 billion in aggregate savings. Pete, I was really interested to read that Mac Common, chief executive of the Commonwealth Bank, came out on the weekend to say that three quarters of their loans are about two years ahead in repayments. So the head of the bank said, hey, there's no problem, while the bank economists say, property market's going to crash. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. We know we've got a strong banking system. There's very few non-performing loans. And the other thing, as you said, is the lack of supply of good properties. But also interestingly, recently in the media, Australia's biggest property developer, Harry Trugaboff, said that to make the new projects viable, the big towers he's building, they need to increase prices by 20% because of the increased costs. So that not building new towers at the moment, they're not financially viable and they're not going to be until they push values of their new projects up. And when people are prepared to pay for that, when, when eventually there's nowhere else to live, they're going to have to pay for that. And that's going to pull up the value of established apartments as well, Pete. Yeah, I just saw on a property update this morning, actually, uh, the Cordell uh, construction cost update. And even now, the uh, June quarter of 2022 construction costs still up at double digit rate. So that's a it's a huge increase in uh, the cost of adding new dwelling supply, particularly for apartments now. Very hard to get those developments off the ground. Um, mm. but it's, um, I guess the thing with um, rising mortgage rates, well, a lot of borrowers have never seen a, a rate rise, certainly the younger no. cohort. Um, so until that fear goes away, 
the sentiments um, is is taking a hit. But um, I, I guess the rising mortgage rates they do reduce borrowing capacity. But as we mm. know, m- most borrowers don't use their full borrowing capacity anyway. And I think, as you said, the the big thing really is just the, the media commentary. Every day there's a headline about you know ten percent downturn, fifteen percent downturn, and property crash. This, that, and the other. So. If you've got, um, if you're somebody who's looking to be an investor, and I guess you've seen this all so many times before, how can you remain positive or take a long term perspective when everything you read in the media these days is headline driven and clickbait driven and the news is almost relentlessly negative? Well, I'll answer that. Then I'll actually get back to your initial question that, like a good politician, I escaped about timing the market. But I think it is difficult at the moment to remain positive. You're 100% right. So first of all, you've got to understand that it's not the media's job to educate you, Pete. It's their job to get your eyeballs on their website where advertisers have already paid to appear there. And the media knows it's much easier to do that with clickbait headlines and with negative news than with positive news. Now, I've noticed how we've just changed over the decades since you and I got to know each other a number of decades ago. We used to read those monthly magazines or the newspapers and we'd rely on data that way, but now it's all digitally delivered. And and, and the time frame that they're around, you're on Twitter regularly. I love following you on Twitter. But the time frame of those is really minutes, seconds, hours. So the media has to keep flooding us with information. And I think it's just important to remember that the media is not the friend of the disciplined and the patient investor because they focus on the short term while, you know, they focus on market predictions, the next hotspot, the negative views. So as an investor, to be successful, we really need to take a long-term perspective. So be careful who you listen to. And I know many people, I've actually not had the discipline to do it, Pete, but I know many people actually just turn off the media, don't listen to the news. I did that during COVID. I did that during the period after the Ukraine war. It just, it was too hard to keep taking all the negative news, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's um, it's very difficult to go uh, cold turkey. I know some people who do. I know some people who almost never read the news. But um, I think um, when it comes to finance commentary, it probably pays to choose your sources carefully um, yeah. because, yeah, I mean, there are, there are some people who have vested interests who, you know, relentlessly preach the, the doom and gloom angle regardless of what's happening, particularly now with media being electronic. Um, you, you're not going to get sort of plain vanilla Uh, viewpoints you're just going to get extreme predictions uh uh, one way or the other um so yeah you sound much smarter pete if you say the market's going to crash you actually sound like a a fool and a a consistent optimist rather than realist if you say the market's actually just going to behave and do what it always does yeah yeah and if you think of all the, the crash predictions we've had over the the years and the decades but i mean you only need to look back at median uh, property prices from 10, 20, 30 years ago to say that even though we do get cyclical downturns, the long-term trend um, yep. for nominal prices has is, is practically always been up. So with all that then, Pete, the, back to your original question, if I may interrupt you, is how important is it to time it? Understanding those influences, the negative and the positive, understanding the media is trying to scare you, I guess People also have read that Warren Buffett quote, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And so they interpret that as, okay, buy at the bottom when others are fearful and sell at the top. And Pete, we noticed a lot of investors sold over the last year or two when the market was strong, when their properties were behaving, were performing like they should. And that didn't make sense to me. But as you said earlier on, a lot of people miss the boat because they're waiting for the perfect timing. I think at this stage of the cycle, there are opportunities and there are markets within markets. So you've got to own the right sort of properties, the sort that will always be in strong demand. The top end of the market, that always leads the high most affluent properties, the, the exclusive suburbs of our big capital cities, led the boom. They're now leading the downturn. They're not really what I'd call investment grade properties in those locations. The lower end where currently uh, people are going to have more affordability issues because their wages aren't going up as much as the value of the properties. They're probably going to suffer a bit more. But in fact, the more 
a middle range, and I'm not saying median price, but above the median price, where the more affluent, the gentrifying people are, are, are moving into the suburbs, which are gentrifying as people, skilled workers have got, got jobs, they've got money, they're still moving on with their lives. They're the suburbs, A-grade homes in those investment-grade suburbs that I still think are going to do well, but it's a good time to actually take your time, do your homework, do your research, and then get into the market based on your own financial circumstances and your decisions should be finance-driven when you're financially able to do it and comfortable to do it and not market-driven, Pete. Yes, I remember um, reading some analysis by Stuart Weems, who's a friend of the show and, of course, yes. um, also on your podcast. And he did some really good analysis on the importance of timing the property market. And I think um, because you do get quite long uh, property market cycles, Timing the market in property can be somewhat less important than maybe in stocks. But I think one of the interesting yep. findings he had there that is, as you mentioned just before, if, you, if you're investing in non-investment grade property markets, which can be much more volatile, um, like holiday mm. homes or mm. you know, mining towns or one industry towns and so on, um, well, those markets timing is important because the, the, the demand isn't consistent. Whereas if you're investing in the the types of properties and locations that you recommend, then the timing is actually less important because it's a smoother journey through the cycle. I think the other key finding that Stuart had is that the longer you own an investment yeah. for, the less important the timing is. So obviously, if you're looking to buy and sell a property in a year, then obviously the timing is critical. But if you're holding an investment for maybe five property cycles, 35 years. Well, the, the timing actually doesn't matter that much. Surprisingly, um, the returns are very similar, whether you buy it a peak or a trough. Very much so. So it's much more important to own a A-grade asset, an investment-grade asset, than buying it well. So the buying it well, buying it cheaply is a one-off profit. But if you can just outperform the markets by a small amount, one or two percent per annum capital growth, the compounding that makes a big, big difference, doesn't it? Yeah, that's it. So so don't ignore timing completely, but do no. try to pick a quality investment property with all of the the fundamentals of supply and demand that should drive the long-term returns. And I know yep. you always focus on the the sort of proven or uh, tried and tested suburbs with a, a long track record of delivering results. That I way. think you also have to look in the future, Pete, not just in the past. I agree with what you're saying, mm. but where are jobs going to be created in the future? We know that there's going to be a period of lower capital growth because we've been through a once in a generation boom and we know that wages are lagging the increased value of properties, but there are still some locations where more affluent people, where skilled knowledge workers, where some of the skilled migrants who are coming in are going to be able to afford to and want to live in those areas and pay a premium because of scarcity. And Peter, it's not just owner-occupiers, it's actually also tenants, because if you think about it, your future income is going to be totally dependent upon your tenants' ability to keep paying higher rents over time. So that's why it's important to look at demographic trends as well. Yes, absolutely. So um, so not not only the proven track record, but also looking for uh, markets with a, a good outlook as well and good future prospects. So I guess if you're looking at the less volatile parts of the market, then the timing becomes equivalently less important, especially if you're taking a long-term view. So I guess um, an obliquely related question, I guess this is the, the third of the, the four questions we're going to cover off. We sort of mentioned that some of the sources of uh, property market information and um, economic forecasts can sometimes just be relentlessly negative, but who, mm. who, who, who should you actually listen to for property advice? Do you have any recommendations of where people should go for, for information? Yeah, the Pete Wharton podcast. <laughs> Why? Oh, well. because, you actually, because you're choosing people who've got a proven track record, who've actually done things. Look, I think it's important to listen to people you can rely on who've got a proven history. And there are 25 million property experts in Australia. Everyone's got an opinion. But just because they've got an opinion doesn't mean that you should actually listen to it or they've got a right 
to tell you. It would give you advice because opinions and advice are different. Uh, only listen to people who've actually achieved what you want to achieve. Pete, I've got a number of people who troll me on my YouTube channel. I've got 10,000 subscribers. And they're the same people who, who keep telling me the world's going to fall apart. But have you noticed that you actually never get trolled or given negative opinions by people who've done better than you? It's always people who've not done as well as you. Do you want to save on buyer's agent fees? You could save thousands with Buyer's Buyers. As Australia's most extensive network of buyer's agents, we can lock in highly competitive prices. Plus, our national network of buyer's agents are some of the best in the business. So get the Buyer's Buyers advantage and talk to us today. Call 1800 975 051 or visit buyersbuyers.com.au. For those of you looking to buy an investment property in the near future, make sure you join our free Investor Hotspots webinar on Thursday, 21st of July at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll be joined by property expert Alistair Lias as we take you through where the best places to buy Australia-wide are in this cooling market. So we'll give you our tips on how to choose an A-grade investment, what are the risks, what are the opportunities, and we'll look at the property market outlook for the next 12 months. So secure your spot and join our investor webinar on Thursday, July 21st by registering at buyersbuyers.com.au or you can click on the registration link in this episode's show notes. If you're looking to achieve something, it usually makes sense to uh, to follow people who've actually got a track record and some level of achievement or achieve what you want to achieve because um, otherwise you're not really going to get the first-hand insights. And um, yeah, thank you for the plug on the podcast. We do we try to get a range of uh, people on and a range of views and experiences. You know, there's no one size fits all when it comes to property. But um, as you say, I think there is there's certainly a thing the people who are warning about, you know, the next downturn and the next recession and all the rest of it, it kind of it sounds um, almost more intelligent. But actually, yes, yes. you know, there's well, there's been studies done on this very point. But actually, you show that you know the world over time is generally improving, the economy is growing, even though in the short term it feels like everything's doom and gloom. Actually, over time, uh, optimism is actually the right default setting for the way that successful investors should be thinking. Oh, very much so. So it's important to remember, as you said right at the beginning, the long-term trend has always been upwards for hundreds of years. And we're going through winter at the moment. I'm not talking about the season, but the winter of the property market. And for, for I don't know, 2,000 years, uh, for uh, which spring's always followed winter. And I know it's going to happen again this year, and I'm prepared to put my money on that in the property market as well. And look, we know even the property experts tend to get it right, despite being armed with all the research. Isn't it interesting how they got it so wrong over the last little while? And I guess that means that property movements aren't an exact science. There are lots of fundamentals that are easy to monitor. We've already talked about things like population growth, supply and demand, employment, interest rates, affordability, inflationary pressures. But I think the overriding factor that the experts have real difficulty quantifying is consumer sentiment, home buying sentiment, investor sentiment. And as we said, currently it's slow, the lowest it's been for a while. And that means, unfortunately, even the most rational of us tend to suffer from these lapses of logic, especially when it's dealing with money, with big investment decisions. People are most confident a year or so ago when the market was booming, when maybe they should have been a bit more cautious. And they're probably least confident now when, when you look back, it'll be seen as, as, as a buying opportunity. So I think it's uh, important to be careful who you listen to. And I believe if we look at the end of this year, and I hope I'm going to have a chat with you at the end of the year to see how my forecast is suggesting, Sydney and Melbourne markets falling further, probably 6 7 8% over this year. But I see that the Brisbane, Perth and Adelaide property markets are going to keep growing at a much lower rate. So when those predictions of the property markets in Australia falling 10, 15, 20, and I know one uh, popular commentator saying 30%. I can't see that happening. I think it 
Yeah, when you take the weighted average, it may drop a little bit by the end of the year, but not much because there's nothing much going to hold back in the short term. Brisbane, Perth and Adelaide, Adelaide's the strongest market at the, at the moment. But the biggest fall there's ever been, Pete, uh, was 2017, December uh, 2017 to June 2019. It was about 18 months when the property market fell because of the concern about the upcoming election, because of the tightening of the screws from APRA, a bit of a credit squeeze, and it dropped 9.9% the overall Melbourne, uh, Australian property market. And we know there isn't a property market. So some suburbs did better than others. Some states did better. But these predictions of an overall fall of uh, 10, 15, 20% would mean it's the worst crash on in modern history. And the fundamentals just don't suggest that's going to happen, Pete. Yes, interesting. Um, <clears throat> at a time when inflation is expected to hit 7%, that people are expecting prices in nominal terms to, to drop so much. It, it, I mean, it feels to me um, uh, as though if, if inflation isn't going to peak until uh, the December quarter, yep. then I, I think consumer sentiment or particularly housing market sentiment is going to be weak and, until people get comfortable that interest rates are going to stop rising. Now, it feels like 1st of February next year, I think it'll be interesting to see where things are at because I think by then there'll be a bit more clarity that actually, although mortgage rates have gone up, they're not going too high. I think you, you, you sort of touched on an interesting uh, paradox there, and that is in every cycle, when it's really easy to buy property and it's an easy time to negotiate and vendors are looking to offload, very few people are actually willing to pull the trigger. And then, of course, when the market's booming, people are rushing through the door, you know, trying to yeah. sign a contract as quickly as they can. And so I suppose the the related fourth and final question is, if you have uh, borrowing capacity today, let's say uh, capability to buy a property, would you look to buy a property now while sentiment is low? Would you wait towards the end of the year and try and um, hopefully pick up something a bit cheaper? Or would you actually wait until the market has bottomed out and they're starting to rise again? Um, If it was you, what would you do? Well, first of all, when you're looking to buy a property, there are three things to fiddle with, three levers, your borrowing capacity, and that's controlled by the bank's location, and that's something we don't like to compromise on, and then the right property in that location. If interest rates are going to rise, and I agree with you that they will, because they're still at stimulatory levels at the moment, that means your borrowing capacity is going to be less in three, six, nine months' time as interest rates rise and the banks are going to say you can't service as much. So just to make things simple, because I'm not very good with maths in my head, if you could borrow a million dollar property, buy a property for a million dollars today um, and you could service that, uh, but in three to six months' time, maybe the banks would only lend you $900,000. Do you really think that property is going to drop that 10%. So by waiting, it's quite possible that you're going to miss out on the property that you're able to buy today. And if you think about it, if you buy today, it doesn't really matter if it drops a little bit in the short term. The next time it's going to matter is when you want to refinance it in three, five years time to move to the next investment property or to your next home. And by that time, if you've bought the right asset, it will have increased in value again. So I don't think timing is... uh, the, waiting for the right time is the right thing to do, A, because people's borrowing capacity is going to be more difficult. And by the time people know the market's moved, it's actually already too late because they're going to be the uh, reports of higher auction clearance rates, prices going up, uh, the market is going to have already moved, you're going to miss the bottom. So that's that old saying, I, I'm not sure who had said it, when was the best time to buy property 20 years ago, the second best time is today. If you can afford it, if you've got a good job, if you've got the right finance, and more importantly, if you've got buffers to see you through. So smart investors, strategic investors buy themselves time to ride the cycle. But again, back to the emotions, I think one of the reasons people don't want to buy now is A, they don't want to see the property drop in value a bit. And the other is, Pete, a bit of ego. They don't want to seem silly when they tell their friends, hey, I bought a property in in three months' time, the market's gone down 5%. Yeah, it's almost the the fear of missing out has almost uh, gone the other way now, fear of buying 
buying too soon, I suppose, or too early. Yes, yes. I think um, yeah. one of the really interesting things, given where um, interest rates are, which is still in absolute or historic terms, still very low. Um, a lot of talk about um, housing finance dropping off, but I, I was looking at the the latest uh, monthly figures, exclude all the refinancing. There was still um, $32 billion worth of um, housing approvals last month. Now, pre-COVID, we were tracking at about 20. So it's still, there's a huge amount of um, sort of appetite there, potentially sitting on the sidelines, but maybe people, particularly home buyers, I think are just sort of uh, circling the market and not pulling the trigger. But um, I suspect the underlying demand when immigration kicks off again, and I think there's a lot of noises being made about a strong rebound in immigration to fill the skill shortage. Um, I think that the market could snap back quite quickly. Uh, it could be next year, though, potentially before that happens. Sure. So I believe that the finance approvals are one of the good leading indicators that an investor should keep an eye on because, sure, not everyone who gets their finance pre-approved is going to make that commitment, but clearly there's an appetite. So... I think one of the other lessons maybe to think about is be careful where you invest and don't necessarily invest in your own backyard. Again, when we spoke a moment ago about the levers, you can pull the finance. Well, that's organised by your proficient finance broker. Location, it doesn't have to be where you're comfortable with uh, because, again, there are still some strong opportunities in the smaller capital city markets of Australia and within certain locations in those markets. So look for an A-grade asset, be comfortable diversifying and owning properties in other states. Don't speculate. Don't count on capital growth. Look at the fundamentals. So don't, don't, don't buy off the plan hoping that the end value is going to go up. Don't buy house and land packages where there's actually going to be some tightening of that, that market where some of the first home buyers are going to have some difficulty uh, moving forward. And I think also get advice. This is the time to make a plan, to plan to become the person you plan to become. And of course, Pete, you got to plan that your plan's not going to go to plan because life's going to change along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I, I was actually um, reading a, an interesting article, article by um, Noah Smith on, I think it was on his blog uh, yesterday about a lot of um, bullshit in investing circles that you do tend to see when markets are, are buoyant like they were over the past couple of years and lots of people promising get rich quick schemes and Ponzi schemes and low risk, um, 20% returns and so on. I think the thing with um, real estate um, wealth is that like you don't you don't really need to reinvent the wheel because there's a very time proven strategy. Uh, you've detailed this in your books, you, you know your four pronged approach where you you just look to buy quality assets under market value, renovate and hold them for the long term and so on. Let's try and recap on the four questions that we've covered off today. So if I could just answer that before you go on, yeah, of course. that's a simple approach. And my investing philosophy is too simple for intelligent people. They actually look for more than that. They think it can't be as simple as that. The, the things that you said, buy good asset in an area that's always going to be in strong demand, get something with good land to asset ratio, find something you can add some value to. They look for some tweaks, some twists, something special. It doesn't have to be done because when you go to those exotic terrains, you usually get it wrong, Pete. Yeah. So, well, let's let's um, let's recap on the the four key questions then. So, yeah. And um, let's see if I get this right. So, I guess on the first point, the, the time in the market is the key thing, rather than fine tuning yes. the entry yes. point too much because you, you probably won't manage it, and uh, in the long run, it's not that important anyway. Taking a long term perspective rather than trying to follow the day to day news because I I guess yep. if you if you're taking a uh, you know a twenty or thirty year investment in real estate it really doesn't matter what what happens uh, to a certain data point um, today or tomorrow oh, that's really just background noise and uh, I guess this is this one of the points that Warren Buffett always comes back to. If you buy a farm, then you, you can't really go along and cheer for the you know the farm to produce more you know day to day and week to week. You're buying it because it's a long term business decision. And I think the same should apply to any sort of real estate investment. Um, the third question on who you should listen to for property advice. Well, I guess 
there are some experts out there, but um, in particular, people with a long sort of track record of success and achieving what what you're looking to achieve, I think, um, was, mm-hmm. was the key point there. And um, in terms of the the right time to buy, well, usually, if I understood correctly, when you've got the financing, you've done the research, and you've got um, some level of confidence about uh, where and how to buy a quality asset. Is that a fair summary? I think it's a great summary, Pete. We should have just started with that and we could have already been off <laughs> doing our other things. <laughs> Michael, I know you've um, been around as a strategist and uh, a mentor and a, an investor over a very long time, but uh, if people want to find out more about what you guys do at Metropole and um, if they want to tune into your podcast, where should they go to find out more? Well, the easiest with the podcast is wherever you're listening to this podcast, just look for the Michael Yardney podcast. And my team at Metropole gives strategic wealth and property advice, metropole.com.au. And maybe you could join the, I think it was about 2.7 million people who read my daily property update uh, briefing last year. And we're getting similar numbers again this year, halfway through the year. I think there's already been 1.7 million unique readers read it each day. So uh, that's uh, something I'm very proud of. Property update. Yeah, it's been quite a journey, hasn't it? I remember back in the. Uh, I the remember early... when we first started. You were one of my early outside contributors. <laughs> yeah, yes. I, re- I remember in the early days there was uh, Michael Matusik and uh, yourself churning out the the daily content, and I was uh, throwing in the odd bits and pieces. And yet, mm. you know, um, I guess the power of uh, compounding growth. You've uh, seen millions and millions of views over the years, which is so uh, great mm. to see. Thank you. So uh, thank you so much. Well, let's check in uh, later in the year and let's um, see how those predictions play out and um, we'll see when the property market begins to turn around. Thank you, Pete. So don't forget to register for my Investor Hotspot webinar Thursday, 21st of July at 7pm. It'll be 45 minutes. So simply register at buyersbuyers.com.au or click on the registration link in the show notes to this episode. You'll also get a copy of our market wrap, our 2022 investor report that's hot off the press, so to speak. So I look forward to seeing you then. Cheers. Thanks for listening to Pete's Property Podcast, powered by Buyers Buyers. Don't forget to subscribe and join us next time as Pete chats all things property with a new guest. And just a reminder, that the information provided in this podcast is general advice only and doesn't take into account your personal financial situation or needs. You should always consult a licensed professional to discuss your individual personal circumstances.